Um, as Barry said, I've been doing this over about 20 years. My first job was at the Arkansas Diagnostic Laboratory in Fayetteville or Springdale at the time. And uh, while most of my work has been in commercial birds, we, we do a fair bit of, of backyard birds or hobby birds um, as well. And we currently do that at our diagnostic laboratory in Stillwater. It's at Oklahoma State. It's on the campus just across from the vet school. We do approximately 100 autopsies on chickens and turkeys and peafowl and whatever else comes in a year. And that's out of about 1,000 autopsies that we perform um, just every year on every species you can imagine. We also do literally thousands of blood tests on birds. Most of those are commercial birds, but some backyard birds as well. And when I say backyard birds, I'm just talking primarily about hobby birds um, are more commonly now pets, family member birds, you know, where someone has five or six birds and, and they may even live in the residence with the people. Um, but we do that as well. A couple disclaimers here. Um, a lot of the credit for this goes to other people as far as some of the images. I, I captured most of the images myself, but some of these even date back to when I was at the University of Illinois on faculty there, and Dioki Tripathy, who was, um, he's, he's well recognized for work in Merrick's disease, and, and I inherited his diseases of poultry class. He was ready to quit, and they put it on me, and uh, I enjoyed that, but with that came some of the materials that I'm gonna share with you now, because some of the pictures are pretty good. Um, and the other thing too is my primary job now is as a pathologist. So I serve as the lab director, but what that means is I primarily see uh, dead and dying birds. And so, and then I do autopsies on dead birds. And so unlike uh, most veterinarians who actually go out and their goal is to save the patient, you know, I do autopsy on the patient, provide information, and then hopefully you can work with your veterinarian to decide how do we protect the rest of the birds. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, the Diagnostic Laboratory is an accredited lab. We're a member of the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. And this map here is the National Animal Health Laboratory Network. And I mention this because, as I will tell you later, uh, we currently also partner with the Oklahoma Department of Ag. They're a great partner of ours, and they have a program going now that provides a subsidy on those autopsies I was talking about, bird testing. So if you have a chicken die or you have friends that have a chicken die and they want to submit it to us for autopsy for testing, uh, the Department of Ag will cover the cost of that testing with the trade-off that we will check the, the trachea or windpipe for bird flu, avian influenza. And so we just do that as part of the surveillance and so the trade-off is essentially um, we try to find the answer, we provide you with the answer, um, but they get the testing that they want for surveillance. So. I'm gonna talk about just a couple pieces of anatomy and a couple of real high level items here. Um, you hear terms uh, that people use and, and they don't always make sense. If they come out, for example, someone comes out and they say, hey, we're gonna get a swab of, of your chicken. You're always wondering, I'm wondering, what end of the chicken are you wanting a swab of? And so when they say coana, even though the word ana sounds like anal, it's not, it's, it's the front end. So coana is that little slit when you open your chicken's mouth and it leads right up into the nasal passages. And so if you have birds that you know, look like they have a disease with runny eyes, runny nose, sudsy eyes, things like that, you can often get a swab there for a diagnosis. It's hard to see this image, it's kind of washed out, but that's a mouth open with the tongue, and at the back of the tongue is that little slit opening, and that opens into the trachea or into the windpipe. That's called the glottis. And then they'll talk about cloaca as well, which is the back end of the bird. So if they do cloacal swabs, um, that's the back end of the bird. Poultry anatomy, I'm, I suspect if you guys have birds, you probably have at least dissected a bird or opened a bird or field dressed a bird at some point. Um, and when you open them up, you can see there are very fine, thin tissues all on the inside of a bird. And those are the air sacs. Most birds, most, well, all chickens, most birds have nine air sacs. And when you open them up, you can see that very thin, shiny, translucent membrane. That's the air sac. So if you do have a bird die, and people will often be curious, I know when I was even a kid, I was curious what, what happened to the chicken. And I would open it up, look inside. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I, I would look inside. Um, so that thin membrane, that's normal. It should be translucent. I've got a picture here of one that's not translucent. You can see it's wet, sudsy, and that's an indication that there's something going on. It won't tell you exactly what it is. It could be bacterial, it could be viral, it could be a combination. 
Um, it could even be early egg yolk peritonitis uh, if you have a 26, 28 week old hen pullet that's just starting laying. So you can see that. Um, but that's one of the early indicators when you open up a bird is do the air sacs look okay? Is there evidence of air sac disease? And the most common cause of air sac disease in backyard chickens is mycoplasma. And we, we see a lot of mycoplasma. Hopefully many of you guys have your birds tested each year as part of the NPIP program, the National Poultry Improvement Plan program. Uh, immunology, birds have T cells and B cells. Matter of fact, that's where the word B cell comes from. It's from the bursa. So it was described originally in chickens. And uh, at the very back end of the bird, at the lower end, you see the cloaca there. Um, and the little nodule above it, I think I have a pointer. Yep, this nodule here is the cloaca. And this is one opened up. And that's where your B cells or B lymphocytes come from. And then in the neck of a chicken, and this is opened up, here's the windpipe, trachea. And along the neck of this young bird, we have thymic tissue or thymus, and that's where the T cells come from. So that's the immune system, if you will, of a chicken. They don't have lymph nodes, unlike us. We have about 300 lymph nodes. Chickens really just don't have lymph nodes. So they're not organized like that. They're pretty primitive. So here's what I'm gonna cover, and don't, don't freak out. It's gonna be at a pretty high level. I've got a lot of photos to show you some gross lesions or, or lesions of uh, different, different uh, diseases. And so I'm gonna hit on a couple words here. Avian influenza, it's big, I put it up front because it's one of the diseases that we in the US are routinely looking for. It's in wild birds, we know that it's in migratory, migra migratory waterfowl, um, and we hope that it doesn't hit our backyard birds and commercial birds. So in 2015, 2016, the last time we were dealing with bird flu, uh, it cost the US about $2 billion. So it cost the government about a billion and it cost the industry about a billion. Um, and in that outbreak, it was identified in backyard birds as well. Um, most of the economic impact was in the commercial sector, uh, but it does hit the backyard birds. And you wonder why do we care about avian influenza? Well, type A influenzas can jump between people and pigs and chickens, and, and that's why we're really looking. And we keep surveillance at our lab for those diseases uh, in swine and in poultry, just as, a, as part of our network. But you can see the great epidemic of 1918, that was a, an influenza outbreak. 20 to 50 million humans died. I mean, these are, these are big issues. Fortunately, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot better supportive care, antibiotics and things like that these days, and vaccines. So this is a picture I took of a bird that was artificially or experimentally infected with a highly pathogenic influenza. And so this is when I was at Plum Island. We infected birds with various diseases and then we would document the progression. To call it high path AI, which is really the one you're concerned about, um, you have to take the virus, put it into chickens, and it kills 75% of the chickens within about a week. And that qualifies as a high pathogenic. Um, kills turkeys a lot faster than chickens typically. Some chickens um, will only have mild symptoms. But in this case, you can see the skin's reflected from the eye, around the eye. And the big change here is just how wet everything is. There's a lot of wetness. This is the comb of a rooster. You can see it's opened up here. And you can see that there's yellow fluid that's accumulating. It's even puddled down here. So it's a really edematous uh, comb. This is the shank of a bird. Um, if you look here at the hawk, you can see there looks like bruising, but it's really acute hemorrhages, a lot of edema. And so you typically will have high mortality. And if you see this type, these type of lesions with high mortality, um, that's when you probably should be given um, either your vet or the state vet or somebody a call to say, we want we want you to figure out, help us figure out what's going on here. It's gonna transition into exotic Newcastle disease. And the reason is because we're still fighting that here in the US. So out in Southern California, they've been fighting Newcastle disease since I think about March of this year. Um, and it looks fairly similar. It's caused by a different virus. It's a related virus, but it's different. Um, and as with avian influenza, you can have some low path strains and some really highly pathogenic strains of it. Um, and this just tells you about the lesions. They vary depending on how pathogenic. And with the worst form, which is the really highly pathogenic form, uh, we see lesions that um, in acutely dead birds that really tip us off that something's going on. This bird has edema around the head and face. That's not gonna tip you off. And what's important is if you have a sick chicken and you get on the internet, I would bet you that whatever you find is gonna be a description that covers most diseases. So you can't get on the internet and say, my bird has a puffy head, 
what do I have, and, and feel like you have one of these bad diseases, because you probably have one of the common diseases. It's just chickens respond in a very limited number of ways. This is the stomach of the chicken, so you know you have the gizzard, and just upstream from the gizzard is your, your proventriculus or the gastric stomach. And when you open it up, if you've got hemorrhages in there, that tells me there's probably something significant going on here. And same way with the gut. And so you probably have pulled out the gut of a chicken before, and you notice that when you get almost to the end, there's a couple blind sacs, the cica, that come off. And that's what we have here is the opening of a cica. So this would be the head of the chicken up here. This is going to be the end of the small intestine. This will be the colon. And then right here is going to be the uh, cica. And so we have fairly distinctive lesions in that that tip us off. We should be testing for either avian influenza, bird flu, or Newcastle disease. Now we're getting to the diseases that you may see. I hope, we all hope, that you do not see bird flu or avian influenza or Newcastle disease. Um, Laryngotracheitis is one that does circulate here. It's, it's not uncommon in commercial birds, and uh, people tend to vaccinate for it. And so the kicker is, is that if you catch it, you're probably most likely going to catch, your birds will catch the vaccine strain. So the vaccine is attenuated, but it, it's not very stable, so it has a tendency to flare up and become even uh, more pathogenic. But that's pretty much the strain that's going around these days um, in various, especially if commercial birds are around. You're going to see some, some Newcastle or some uh, ILT infectious laryngotracheitis. It's a herpes virus. This is not a great picture, but what's going to tip you off is it's usually going to be your four to six month old birds, and they're going to be gasping. We call it gaping, but gasping. Um, they'll shake their head quite a bit, and they may even have blood in their mouth. And the reason is, is that they've got uh, inflammation and plugging along their windpipe or trachea. And when you open it up, this is, uh, these are pinheads here to hold this, but this is going to be the glottis, so that slit we saw at the back of the tongue. What happens is they get a horrible tracheitis to the point that they get these plugs of necrotic tissue, and they're effective they're, they're able to effectively cough them up to the base of the tongue, but given the, uh, the, the slit-like opening of that glottis, they can't really cough it out. And so they effectively suffocate from that plug being right there in their trachea, in their windpipe. Here's another section here, and it's, you, these are pinheads. Those black things are pinheads just to hold open the trachea. But you can see how we have just this nasty plug. Here's a hemorrhagic plug, and here's more of a caseous plug. Um, but yeah, these birds will have typically high mortality. Um, it's going to be uh, the four to six month old birds, so right before they become sexually mature. Um, and when we open them up, we see pretty typical lesions. You can't really get to it. And so even if you were to open the windpipe, in a live bird that is, if you were, you know, you're just not going to be able to do that. The glottis is pretty, um, it's narrow and it's pretty fixed. It's not like it opens, it's not real flexible. Yeah. And a chicken doesn't really like you to do that either. So, Histologically, we see very characteristic viral inclusions that tell us this is herpes virus, but we use other types of testing as well. There's a blood test uh, for this uh, virus. Um, the first three viruses I've mentioned are reportable diseases, so the state vet, and in our state it's Rod Hall, he's a state veterinarian. He has a, uh, an assistant state vet who is, oversees the poultry, and his name is Dr. Mike Heron. So some of you may have seen Mike before. Really easy to work with. The state folks here uh, really want to help you out. Um, the approach by state veterinarians in every state is different. And so in our state, um, you know, it may not be as uh, maybe aggressive and strict as some of the other states. So we have neighboring states that you know, the, the, they will pretty quickly depopulate your birds. Here, what they do is they'll look and see, you know, what do you have? How close are commercial birds, you know, which could impact the economy? Um, and if they're not very close, they'll make decisions based on that. But a lot of clients will call me and say, we're concerned, you know, that we looked on the internet, we think we have influenza or something like that because our birds have snotty nose. Um, and they're afraid that the state's going to come out and kill all the birds. Well, I haven't had that happen in Oklahoma yet. Um, if we had influenza, it would happen, just so you know, that would happen. But knock on wood, we haven't had influenza. Um, but most diseases, the state just lets you manage them, basically. And, and the more common ones, you can manage with antibiotics. One other virus that I'm going to talk about, and I think this is the last one, is infectious bronchitis. And I mention this one because you may see this, 
it's circulating out in wild um, and backyard chickens as well as we see it occasionally in commercial birds. They vaccinate pretty extensively in commercial birds. And as the name implies, it causes bronchitis. And so you would think that you're primarily going to see respiratory, and you may, even though the signs are pretty mild. But the one thing you probably will see are eggs that are misshapen. So they may have really thin eggs, uh, shells. They may have wrinkled shells. They may even be missing a shell. Um, and you can see, you know, these all came off the line from some birds that had infectious bronchitis or coronavirus. Um, but it gets your attention whenever you get really ununiform and wrinkled eggs. And so that's a virus that causes that. It typically goes through, um, here's an egg that the white is actually clear. And so, you know, that'll get your attention as well if you crack open one of those. It's probably only second in terms of calls I get about eggs uh, to worms in the eggs. And so that will really get people's attention if they crack open an egg and they see a worm in it. Um, and that happens because um, backyard chickens and commercial chickens actually tend to have parasites. And most parasites of the intestinal tract um, are really not that pathogenic. I mean, they'll be there. The birds seem to exist pretty well with most worms, uh, tapeworms, roundworms, you name it. The roundworms like to migrate. And so the larvae, the little ones, will actually migrate through the abdominal cavity or salomic cavity. And if they happen to migrate next to the uh, ovarian cluster, where the ovary yolks are, at the time that one ovulates, then it can become incorporated in the egg. And it's trapped in the egg. And you find it when you crack open that table egg. And like I said, people call me and they're freaking out. And I tell them not to eat it. You know, it probably won't be in the next one, that type of thing. Um, and here we have a, an immature male bird. So you see the testes, those two little white things here at the top are testes. And this is kidney. And birds have three kidney lobes. And if you go to the grocery and buy a whole bird, the kidney's probably still in there because they're embedded into the backbone. Um, and it's hard to suck them out when they, when they do it commercially. So in this case, the kidneys are extremely pale. They should be a deep red mahogany color. Um, and that's because infectious bronchitis also causes kidney inflammation or nephritis. So it affects primarily the reproductive tract, the respiratory tract, and then the kidneys. But again, easily, easy to test for. Um, is seen in the backyard, but primarily people will notice it whenever they're having eggs that are misshapen. That's the biggest thing. Now we're shifting from viral to bacterial, and there's a lot of bacterial diseases, but fortunately, people that raise backyard birds are primarily concerned about two of these. This one I mentioned because it's seasonal. We see it in commercial birds. Um, it can be devastating, but we rarely see it in backyard birds. But it's something to keep on the radar. I've, I've diagnosed a handful of cases um, and it's called foul cholera. It's a very scary name, but it's an acute bacterial infection caused by this bug here, Pastorella motosita. As I said, it's, it's seen seasonally, so it's usually in late summer, fall, and winter. So we're coming into a season where commercially we're going to see a lot of cases in chickens and turkeys. Um, in turkeys, you know, it can actually uh, kill up to 75% of the birds in the house if they don't get them on antibiotics pretty fast. Um, and this is one of those few diseases where your mature chickens are at much more risk than the young chickens. So typically, you know, your babies you have to worry about with one disease or two. The growers, which are like three to eight week old, another disease we'll talk about. And then you get in that four to six month old and you have another set of diseases. Um, and then after that, most backyard birds tend to be pretty uh, protected with the exception of uh, Merrick's disease, which we'll talk about. So what does this look like? Here are the lungs and the trachea removed. So here's a, a fairly normal looking lung, the trachea, and here's a lung that has severe pneumonia. And I could probably pull this lung off and bounce it off the table because it's going to be very, very rubbery. Another example, you can obviously pick out one that looks more normal even though there's still a little bit of fibrin, but this one is severely uh, mnemonic. And that was the reason, this was from a turkey I think, but that's the reason this turkey died. In this case, we have the head of the chicken up here, the legs down here, this is the heart, liver, liver is really enlarged, and then in the abdominal or salomic cavity we have a lot of fibrin, and that's a hallmark that we have uh, a bacterial involvement. E. coli is probably the most common, but we can see it with pastorella as well. Very easy for us to diagnose and tell you what's going on, and you get the birds on antibiotics and it'll take care of this pretty much overnight. Here's the liver. Um, you guys have probably seen chicken livers before. I think most people have. Obviously, they shouldn't have all these little tiny spots in them. 
Um, this one is loaded with, with bacteria, so we could easily culture that. And that's something in your field, you can, I mean, we have clients that will bring us parts. They may not bring us the whole bird. If they open it up and they say, this liver looked abnormal, we want to know why, they, they'll bring us a liver. Um, our, it can be anything, a cow, deer, horse, whatever it is. This is the joint of a chicken that has cholera. And if you look at the joint fluid, in this case, it's pus. So you have exudate in there. You really don't have nice, clear, viscous synovial fluid. Same way here. Um, and it even is running up the tendon bundles here. So we have exudate or pus in the tendon bundles. Some of the roosters you'll occasionally see that have really distended wattles. And that's more of the chronic form. So these guys won't die overnight like, like the acute form, um, but they get abscesses. And if you were to take your knife and literally cut across here, transect it, it would just be filled with yellow cheesy pus. But that's the chronic form. And the chronic form, the birds that carry the chronic form are the ones that serve as a reservoir. And so obviously I don't have to tell you guys you shouldn't go to a, a bird swap and buy a bird that looks like that, but some people do. It can affect their inner ear and middle ear. And so that's what happens when you have a bird that has a middle ear or inner ear infection. We call it torticollis, so that's the uh, $5 word. But it basically means this bird has a middle or inner ear infection and it can't really locate the ground. It doesn't have a sense of balance and it basically will flip its head around and up underneath its body. So we'll see that with uh, foul cholera as well. This is a turkey. It's kind of hard to get the bearings. That's the eyeball. Here's the, the nostril and the beak is over here. So basically, all around the eye was swollen, and when we cut into it, we just had, you can see this kind of cheesy exudate in there. But again, it's bacterial. We can easily culture that and get you the answer. This is probably one of the most, if not the most common disease that we see uh, in backyard chickens. Uh, the commercial folks, most of the commercial folks have been really good and diligent about eradicating it. Um, it also helps that, that uh, most states require that they do that, so that, that takes care of that. But uh, mycoplasma, really common. Um, probably the greatest threat to your birds, if they're clean, is going to be mycoplasma, getting into it. You'll hear people say CRD or chronic respiratory disease. That's what it causes in chickens. It causes infectious sinusitis in turkeys, so primarily the sinuses. Um, in chickens, it'll be the na nasal cavity, the sinuses, as well as the trachea or windpipe and they just have chronic cough. It's almost like the croup, if you will, that they can't get rid of. And unfortunately, they often get another bacterium on top of it, which makes it even more problematic. But this one is insidious because it's, it's so common, but people have learned if they keep their birds on antibiotics, you can suppress it. And so you can go and buy the most beautiful bird that you've ever seen, and it can be carrying this around because the bird is probably being medicated. You take it home, and you take it off medications for a week or two, and then it blows up and becomes typhoid Mary. And so it'll have runny, sudsy eyes, bubbly nose, um, look horrible, or it'll just make every other bird you have sick. And so we, this is one of the most common things we see at our, at our laboratory is upper respiratory infection due to mycoplasma. Uh, in turkeys, it causes bubble light. It's very impressive in turkeys. You usually don't miss it. In chickens, it's more of a, a silent uh, issue um, just like a kid with a chronic cold that they can't get rid of. So in turkeys, we see this. There's a sinus just beneath the eyeball of a chicken and a turkey called the infraorbital sinus, just below the eye, and it gets filled with pus. And it even will swell up the whole head. So they call it bubble eye, but if you were to cut this open, and I'll show you one here in a minute, it's just a pus ball that's in there. Here's a recent case that we had come through uh, in a peahen. And uh, this is mycoplasma as well, and that's the sinus below the eyeball. There was concern at, with this flock that they had uh, tumors, maybe some kind of a cancer around the eye, but no, it's just the sinus. And when you open it up, or when this was opened up, um, this is a surgical drape here, and so they went in, did surgery on this one, removed it, um, and this is just the really nasty, cheesy exudate or pus that was in there. But this is MG right here. No, typically you put them on antibiotics and it would resolve. The hard part is it's hard to tell in here with the uh, quality of this image, but if you looked at it closely, it looks like an onion when you cut it in half because you had pus laid down over time and in layers. And it's kind of hard for that to resolve. But what they could have done is they could have just made a little cut here and this would have popped right out. Um, but this is an interesting case. 
and one of our path residents, it's a case I had earlier this year, but one of our pathology residents presented at a national meeting um, maybe a couple weeks ago in Kansas City. Just very interesting case. But the flock here, they put them on antibiotics. These were chicken, or uh, peafowl that were commingled with chickens. I think they had guinea fowl and just a, a menagerie of different birds there. Um, but I think the birds all responded well to antibiotics. Um, in chickens, you know, we, you can see this upper respiratory, primarily nasal discharge, a little bit of coughing. It will certainly impact their growth. It'll impact egg production. And the real problem with MG is not only do you buy it as kind of a silent or hidden disease, um, but it's transmitted from bird to bird, so we call that horizontal. It goes from this bird to that bird horizontally, but it also is transmitted through the egg. So from the hen, egg, chick. So it's vertical as well. And that's the real challenge. Um, because just because you hatch off a chick, it may already be infected, depending on if the egg was infected. Again, this is one of the uh, diseases that is included in the surveillance for the National Poultry Improvement Plan, NPIP. They'll test for MG. Um, it's related um, bacterium mycoplasma synoviae, which causes joint infections primarily, um, and then PT, pleurum and typhoid. So again, they, these are air sacs, believe it or not. So we're looking at liver. Um, these are the air sacs that are extremely sudsy. So they call it air sacculitis, so inflammation of the air sac, air sacculitis. Here's one that has secondary E. coli because these birds get really, they get compromised because they're sick and they're chronically sick. And so they're susceptible to other infections like E. coli. And you can see all of this pus. So uh, here's the liver. It's got, it's got exudate all over the surface of it. So we mentioned mycoplasma, and it's really common cause of upper respiratory disease in chickens, super common. Well, this is its partner in crime. So if mycoplasma had a, a drinking buddy, this would be it, and they would both be getting into trouble. Um, Coryza is caused by a bacterium called AV bacterium, so bird bacterium, paragallinarum. Again, facial swelling, serous defomy, ocular secretions. So they have sudsy eyes, conjunctivitis, and then it'll, it'll also occasionally cause other things. It's primarily a a head and respiratory issue. So here's a bird, you can see, it looks like it's uh, kind of sleepy, but really it's just got edema around the head, it's got open mouth breathing, it's just sitting there breathing heavy. Um, another bird with coryza, you can see how puffy it is around the eye. We've got edema of the head, edema uh, in the sinus as well. Um, I think this was a rooster, and you can see that in this case, it's really not that clear. It's kind of becoming brown, so it probably has a secondary component on top of this, either mycoplasma or coryza. But before I leave that, the one thing I do want to mention, and I have said that, is both mycoplasma and coryza seem to respond very well to antibiotics. Um, unfortunately, you almost have to sustain the treatment to control this for a long time, but you're not going to clear it up. So if you buy a bird and they say it's got mycoplasma, you're not going to eradicate mycoplasma from that bird. And so really the only thing to do is to start with really clean birds, protect them, try not to bring anything in, and only bring in birds that are MG free. Otherwise you're going to be dealing with this chronically. And then I'm going to mention aspergillus, but this really only applies to people who are brooding or incubating their own eggs. If you, if you incubate your own eggs, which a lot of people do, hobbyists tend to do this, you may see aspergillus. And it's primarily a fungus, so aspergillosis is a fungus that uh, infects your incubator. And so you have to make sure that between, your, uh, between your, your different broods, you have to clean it out. It's known as brooder pneumonia. Um, it's been around forever. But what will happen is you'll see little chicks, and they're usually the four to seven day old chicks, and they just start gasping. You know, they really aren't making a noise like they're peeping, they're just gasping. And when you open them up, Here's the lung of a chick. So this is one lung, and each one of these is a fungal granuloma, just absolutely riddled with little granulomas. And so that's why they're gasping, because they can't breathe. Rarely, rarely. Yeah, it's typically a human issue. We see it commercially on, on rare occasion, you know, when people just don't have a good sanitation program and they're big commercial, um, either hatchers or incubators. Yep. And there's a lot of fluff. If you guys, anybody that raises chicks, you know, especially if you go into a hatchery, I mean, little tiny feathers are flying everywhere. You know, it's hard to contain all that. 
This is probably the number one killer of chicks that we have here in the U.S. And so these are young birds. They're not going to be the little tiny babies. Um, it's coccidiosis. You probably have heard about coccidiosis. It causes uh, GI imbalances, infections in chicks. Um, we see it typically in chickens, infrequently in turkeys. Um, commercially, they, they will actually expose the chickens to, the baby chicks to it coming out of the hatchery. So they vaccinate them, if you will, by exposure to small numbers. Because once a chicken um, or chick is exposed and recovers, then they're immune. They become immune. You can, we can see it occasionally in older birds, but they usually have to be really, really worn down from something else. Um, huge. I mean, this is a, a little bit older data. So we're talking about a half a billion dollars is what it costs us um, each year just to deal with coccidiosis in these chicks. Most birds are three to eight weeks old. And so if I ever get a call from someone who's losing one to two month old birds, first thing I think is this is a coccidia problem because that's by far the most common. If you buy a commercial ration, it's going to have like amprolium or some coccidia stat in there. I certainly would encourage you to use that um, because the coccidia can get in the soil and it can, or the litter and it can live there for a long time. Yeah, typically you have a lot of birds affected, so morbidity is high, meaning a lot of birds are affected, but low mortality. Um, but people get upset whenever they lose 10 or 20% of their birds. That's quite a bit. Um, rarely does it hit 30% or even higher, but it will stunt your birds. So here, what, here we're looking at a segment of gut, and this is the very first segment of gut here. And you notice that if you've, if you've seen the inside of a bird before, once you get past the gizzard, the small intestine comes off and it makes this tight loop, and stuck in that loop is the pancreas. And so that's what this is in the middle. But the small intestine, from the outside or even the inside should not have red spots on it. So if you open it up and you see these red spots or blotches, um, that's an indication in that age bird, it's probably coccidiosis is probably what you're dealing with. Here's another section. On the outside, you can see all these little tiny red pinpoint hemorrhages. You open it up, you see them on the inside as well. Occasionally, there's more obvious necrosis and what looks like little white flecks on the inside of it. Easy to treat. Um, Hard to prevent, quite frankly, but it's easy to treat um, other than medicated feed. And I would keep them on medicated feed. Coccidia is interesting because there's about five or six different strains of coccidia out there, and they tend to prefer certain parts of the gut. And so we saw that last slide where it likes the very first segment. Well, here's a strain called Imeria tenella that likes the Sika, because we talked about the Sika a while ago, and you can see how they're dark red, they're filled with hemorrhage. And so there's a strain, this strain, that really likes to cause inflammation in the cecum. Same strain, we have it pulled out, the, intestinal, the intestines pulled out. These are the ceca. You open them up and you can just see it's filled with blood. But again, easy to control with medicated feed. Blackhead. Any of you guys ever heard about blackhead? If you raise anything other than chickens, you probably have. I see a lot of birds with blackhead commercially. And ironically, in commercial birds, it's typically chickens. Um, in backyard birds, chickens are extremely resistant. And so if you put a turkey in, or a peafowl, or guinea fowl in with your chickens, you're probably gonna eventually see blackhead. Um, and it's almost impossible to eradicate it from your farm once you have it on the premises. Um, I don't know why it's called blackhead, because even though I've, I've autopsied easily a thousand birds with blackhead, I've never seen one that had a black head. I guess the first fella did, but uh, I, I haven't seen that. Um, it's transmitted by earthworms and bugs and beetles and, and cecal worms. Um, but the biggest thing is co-mingling chickens with your turkeys, typically. Birds, they look sick. I mean, they're listless. They have droopy wings. You can't tell they're really skinny, but they're going to be extremely emaciated. If you pick one up, you can tell that there's almost no musculature left on it by the time it dies. And it can be extremely fatal. And in commercial birds, there's really no treatment anymore. They pulled the... the Used to use an arsenical product. Doesn't sound very good if you think about it. So it was pulled from the market. Um, and so in some commercial operations, if they get this diagnosis in you know, one or six week old, you know, one month or six week old uh, poults, uh, they may just go in and, and, and uh, kill all of them. Here's the lesion. And so we have two lesions that really will tell you, and you can see this if you open your, your uh, turkey that dies. Um, we have these target lesions or bullseye lesions in the liver. Let me show you what they look like. So here's the liver of a turkey with blackhead, and you can't miss these target lesions. Really obvious. And then when you look down at the cica, you can see there are necrotic cores in the cica. These are gonna be extremely firm. 
Um, they have inflammation that goes through the entire wall. They often leak bacteria, so you'll have a secondary peritonitis as well. But this is kind of the kicker. The sulfur-colored feces is a little more iffy, uh, but this is really what you're gonna see. And I've, I've talked to folks on the phone before where they described this clinically, and they said their bird died. They live um, in Durant or someplace like that. They don't wanna you know, drive up to Stillwater, and I tell them, just open it up and look. And if you see a spotted liver, you probably have the answer. With that said, we do have people that mail us chickens probably every week we get a chicken in the mail. And so you can drop a dead chicken, these are dead chickens. You can put a dead chicken um, you know, in a box and send it to us, UPS, FedEx, you know, overnight it to us. Um, I think the one yesterday, I looked at the post, I think it's 25 bucks. But then we'll do the testing, do the autopsy and all the other testing and send them a report and, and the state will cover that. Here's another example where the spots are not quite as obvious as the last bird, but this is still a turkey with black head and you can see we've got nice bullseye lesion, target lesions in the, in the liver. Again, chickens are quite resistant, but they become carriers pretty much for life. But you put a chicken uh, in with a turkey or a peafowl or a guinea fowl, they'll get it. Fowl pox. Have any of you guys seen pox in your chickens? I bet you have and you may not have noticed it. Summertime, we really see a, a lot of pox. Um, and there's, there's two forms, so the dry form and the wet form. Um, so the wet form is typically in the mouth and in the esophagus. The dry form is, I think it's on here, the dry form is on the skin. So that's where you'll see it is up on the comb and the wattle. Um, it's a virus, it's spread. Um, birds can get it from cannibalism. Commercially, we see it from cannibalism. Um, when people aren't picking up their dead birds, your daily mortality. We don't see it as much in cannibalism in backyard birds, because fortunately, I don't think people have that many birds die each day. Uh, but the big thing here, mosquitoes. So mosquitoes carry it from chicken to chicken. Here's the dry form and the wet form, what I just mentioned. So the wet, wet form is in the mouth, dry form is on the skin. And here's what it looks like. So you guys have probably seen this, really common. Um, on the Coleman waddle, you'll have these brown, crusty, raised, real hard lesions. And that's it. It causes crustiness and proliferation. Um, it resolves, and so you don't get too excited about it but it can spread from bird to bird by uh, mosquitoes. Here's a turkey poult with uh, pox as well. It can get extensive. So this, it's hard to see, but this is a wild turkey that presented to us, severely emaciated, but those are all pox lesions on the head. Its feet were absolutely covered with pox lesions as well. Here's a pigeon. You can see it's on the eyelids of the pigeon. It's on the sear as well, so you get these crustiness, but this is pox virus in a uh, pigeon as well. There's a lot of pox virus out there. Here it is in the mouth. This is the wet form. We see that in commercial birds, but we tend not to see it very often in backyard birds. It's usually on the common wattle. But again, it's gonna be summertime most, most, most of the time. Pylorum disease, you probably have heard about that. Fortunately, we don't see it very often anymore, and I think most folks are testing their birds through NPIP testing for PT, pylorum and typhoid, uh, but it's called uh, bacillary white diarrhea. So it's a salmonella is the cause, salmonella pylorum, and it causes uh, GI lesions and septicemia. Primarily it's in, in babies. So most commonly we see it in babies. We do see carrier states in hens, and I'll talk about that here, or show you a picture of that. As the name implies, we get white feces that are stuck around the, the vent or cloaca of these birds. Um, and usually it's two to three week old birds. I have not had a case of pylorum since I came to Oklahoma. So I haven't seen a case here in backyard birds, or, or commercial birds. Um, I mentioned the NPIP testing, so National Poultry Improvement Plan. Um, you, you probably have that test performed, so if you show birds, if you have exhibit birds, you probably have the test performed. In terms of lesions, this is the liver from a chick, and you can see these little tiny spots. It looks a lot like the cholera I was showing you earlier from the uh, adult bird. Um, so this just tells you that it's probably in the blood, and it's probably bacterial. That's what I see when I see this, is that there's probably a bacterial sepsis going on with deposition in the liver. This is the ovarian cluster here. Um, and so if you open up a sexually mature hen, so a hen that's laying, you're gonna see on the uh, left side, you're gonna see a cluster of these. Hens, chickens are born with two ovaries. The right ovary regresses. So it just kind of goes away with age. And so the, ch the hens are left with the left ovary and what will happen is that these, it's filled with follicles. The little follicles um, are, are, are less, are younger, I should say, younger than the big ones. But if you think about this, the follicles are gonna grow in waves. 
And once you get this large follicle, for example, this one, it's going to have blood supply that comes around both sides of it, but it doesn't meet. Doesn't meet. And the reason is that that's where the capsule is going to pop open when it ovulates, and then that follicle will go down, and they're going to deposit an egg around it. So that's a yolk. So really, these grow to the size of a yolk. So if you ever open one up, and they look like this one, they look misshapen, discolored, it's abnormal. Because they should look literally like yolks that are getting the size of a yolk and an egg. And then it's going to pop out. Because once it goes into the uh, reproductive tract, you know, there's no more yolk. Once it comes out of the ovary, that's, that's it for the yolk. The disease that we see most commonly, and yesterday we had a really good case uh, at our lab, our students were able to see it, is Merrick's disease. It's, it's very common. Um, the last two or three years when we've gone through our data and looked, it's been the number one diagnosis presented to us. Typically, it's four to six month old pullets and cockerels, most common age. It goes by other names like range paralysis, polyneuritis, gray eye. It's a herpes viral disease. What's cool about it, really, if you think about this, is that the first effective anti-cancer vaccine in the world was against Merrick's disease. That's pretty amazing. If we could only get more, more of those type vaccines. The problem is you have to use the vaccine to prevent the disease. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of people don't do that. If you go to, to Farm and Fleet, Tractor Supply, places like that that sell chicks, they typically don't you know, pay the extra 35, 40 cents per chick. Um, because quite frankly, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a cost to them. And even when they sell the birds, most of them won't get it, but those that do will be four to six months old. So it'll be long, long gone by then. So the biggest thing is paralysis. If you have a bird, um, we say four to 16 week O, um, but it's usually in that four to six month range that is down and can't walk, especially if it's doing this stretch leg out thing, it's probably gonna be Merrick's. And here's a, here's a pullet right here that uh, has the typical stance. Um, in this case, you, you can tell which leg is paralyzed just by looking at the feet. Uh, most chickens, as you probably know, are always trying to find their balance and footing. So in this case, this is the normal foot where it can feel its toes. In this case, it cannot. So this leg is paralyzed. Um, and that tells you where you should find the lesion. So the lesion is going to be this sciatic nerve here compared to the other one. We also said gray eye. So the lymphocytes, and that's what causes the disease, lymphocytes infiltrate tissues like the sciatic nerve, but they also will infiltrate the iris. So here's a normal eyeball and the iris. Once the lymphocytes get in there, it changes the color um, and that's why they call it gray eye, because it looks gray. This chicken came to me and it was walking around, so the nerve wasn't affected, or at least the nerves of the legs. Um, but the little lady who brought it in was very astute and recognized that the pupil was abnormal. We sacrificed the bird, and you can see how irregular the pupil is. It should look like that, and clearly it doesn't. And that's because it had merics and the lymphocytes had infiltrated the pupil, or the iris, and made the pupil irregular. So gross lesions, we look at the nerves. That's how we diagnose it. There's, you can do a PCR test on a live bird, but it's, it's not super reliable. There's no blood, uh, effective blood test for this. Um, and that's because um, if you don't vaccinate the birds at one day of age, most of them will become infected by probably one week of age because it's so common. Merix is shed on feathers. And, so, and it's been shown that on a feather that's infected, it can float in the air a mile. So if your neighbor has it, or if you have it, you're probably going to be sharing it. Um, vaccinating after one day of age probably doesn't protect the chicks. Commercially, they vaccinate the eggs. So they'll pull the eggs out of the hatcher, or the incubator, they pull them out of the incubator at day 18. They put them on this machine called the Inovaject, and it'll basically inject up to 100 eggs at once. And they pull them back out almost that fast and put them in the hatcher. And they'll just simply do that. And so they're, they're the chicks are born with immunity. So here's a normal sciatic nerve. So this is the sciatic nerve running through here. This is the muscle of the thigh. So we have the thigh opened up right here, the drumstick, if you will, opened up. And you can see these cross striations, and that's fairly normal. In comparison, here's a normal one where you can see the cross striations. This is going to be the leg that's paralyzed, and it's thicker and fatter because you have a lot of lymphocytes in there that's causing nerve damage. Um, this is the backbone. We've removed the kidneys. I think this is probably tape. I'm not sure what Dioki put here just to see this, but the kidneys have been pulled out, and these are the spinal nerve roots that go out and actually become the sciatic nerve. So this is along the backbone. But you can see how thick this side is compared to this side. 
So this is the affected side. This leg would be the one that would be shriveled up. The thing about Merix is even if your birds, say your pullets and cockerels, do not show signs, they can still be harboring it and it will transform over time to cancer. So they will get lymphoma, some of them, a very small percentage, usually less than 5%, will develop lymphoma and you'll have these tumor masses in the liver, uh, the ovary. Um, in this case, here we have the gizzard. You probably recognize the gizzard. Upstream from the gizzard is the real stomach, the proventriculus. If you cross-section it, you can see how it's extensively infiltrated by cancer. And that's pretty typical of, uh, of Merix. This is my last slide, so we'll catch back up here. Um, I want to put a plug in for the Department of Ag. I mentioned that earlier, that they're subsidizing a program, uh, and they have been for a couple years now, where we will do the necropsy, uh, do all of our testing, send you the report. They get a copy of the report because we're also testing the trachea or windpipe for bird flu, avian influenza, as part of the surveillance. But it's a good trade-off because typically um, if we do you know, a whole battery of tests on a chicken, you know, it may cost about 150 to 200 bucks to do all that testing, and they'll pick up that tab um, and you get the answer, as long as they have money to support it. We hope that continues, but they're great partners for us. Um, and the other thing too is we encourage you, I encourage you to go to our website. We have a newsletter that we put out uh, every quarter. Um, you can sign up if you wanna be distributed to that. We just send it electronically four times a year. We don't send spam or other stuff. Um, but I know that we've had at least two or three poultry articles in here in the last three or four years. And we have all of our other issues in there as well. So you can always go to that, open them up, and, and we try to keep everything, what, what they like to call digestible content or snackable content, you know, which is short, kind of the Twitter version. Um, so we do that. But that's all I have. My cards are over there. Um, if we have one minute, I'm happy to answer a question, and then I'll, get, I'll turn the floor over to the next speaker. But I do encourage you to take a card um, and, and shoot me an email or call anytime you have questions. We're happy to, uh, to help you guys. So that's, that's one of the good things about coccidia is that they're really species specific. Even though coccidia can be a problem in puppies, kittens, sheep, um, cattle, calves, they're very species specific. And so, you know, if, let's say your chickens are loaded with coccidia, no other animal that's not a chicken is gonna get that from that chicken. <laughs>